you're listening to the Living in Bosnia and Herzegovina podcast. We're sat here in the garden, yes, because, because why sit in an air-conditioned gloomy room when at least, even though you're sweating buckets, that uh, you can get something, um, you can feel a bit better. It's only going to be 35 degrees today, right? What's going to, I think it's going to be a bit warmer than that. Tomorrow, 37 degrees. Oh, I'm just going to go away and, and melt. Anyway, this week on the podcast, um, I'm joined by uh, Jonathan Gruber, who has arrived about two weeks ago, I think, he'll tell us, um, in the north of the country and then has gone off uh, around the region. Uh, and as normal, I uh, have difficulty in doing research. I think it must be the worst part of my ill-disciplined self. So, Jonathan, without being boring, sure. first, welcome. And Thank who you. is actually Jonathan Gruber? So, Jonathan Gruber is a 54-year-old native of Brooklyn, New York, uh, raised in a nice working-class family in New York City. But I, I made my way over to Europe after college because I uh, met a Dutch woman and then she and I uh, moved in together. We broke up really fast. And then I stayed in the Netherlands for a few more years. And just as I was about to leave the country, I came across a woman who was a Bosnian refugee. So we're talking about 1994 already. This is quite a while ago, my friends. And uh, I fell in love with her. And then we got married. We had children. So it was a neutral it was a neutral place, the Netherlands, so we stayed there, and I I've, I've still live in the Netherlands to this day. Having said that, I have been coming back and forth to this part of Bosnia, the Banja Luka area, right? You called it what, northeast? North, northwest, I Northwest, think. excuse yeah. me, northwest yeah. uh, Bosnia. And I've been coming here since 1997, when there were still tanks rolling in the streets for the peace force that was holding this country together because it was you could i mean evidence of the war at that time was still incredibly evident it was everywhere a lot of the the roads outside of the cities where the fighting was they were basically some tarmac with giant holes in them you know being held together by holes is the expression in all these shot up villages place doesn't look like this now bosnia is all nicely cleaned up and uh it, it's become a pretty wonderful peaceful a uh, beautiful place filled with incredibly kind people. And I come here gladly uh, all the time. And I'm back for the first time after uh, a big COVID break, right? So this is my first time back in two years. And it's better than ever, folks. I love it here. I found you by chance when doing, I, I mentioned earlier my poor research skills, but I was researching... I can't remember exactly what it was to do with Bosnia Herzegovina, and I came across this podcast, uh, which I've subsequently found out won some awards, and it was about this guy, Jonathan Gruber, um, and a lady uh, who had yeah. been born uh, in Banja Luka. It was an almost, how would I say, warts and all uh, story, and that captivated me, and I said, I've, I've really got to meet this guy. So you can imagine um, my excitement at the moment, having the chance to... to to talk to you how the heck did you come to get into a situation where mm -hmm. you talked about this this love story really about a guy from brooklyn that meets a girl from banya luka how did that 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 podcast that that whole thing come about right so this is actually uh i know that my son was two i think when they made that he's 19 now so that means that that's 17 years old that uh, documentary. It was a documentary. And um, when I moved to the Netherlands, one of the first things I did was find myself some work at an organization called Radio Netherlands, which at the time was the external broadcaster of the Netherlands, the equivalent to BBC World Service or Deutsche Welle or Voice of America, that kind of thing. So it was, for the most part, it was a shortwave broadcaster that was quickly in the process of becoming more and more irrelevant uh, after the end of the Cold War. But I, I started working there and I began my journalistic uh, uh, radio career there, uh, first doing news reading and then doing actual reporting and then doing program making and then doing documentaries. So now to the relevant part. When we had there a documentary maker named Dira Sujan and Dira Sujan met me and my wife and we were uh, funny and difficult people. I think that's... Funny and, di funny and really, difficult? That has not changed. <laughs> We are both funny and we are both difficult still. And we have, I think our relationship could best be described as loving and stormy. 
And that too has not changed. But back then, we were both beginning to realize what we'd gotten ourselves into with these very volatile personalities, right? So, sorry, I'm just going to put my water down. So we, uh, uh, Dira got this idea to just sort of, as this strange international couple with a kid, in the meantime, we have two kids, uh, to interview us about what it was like to be in that relationship. And it turned out to be, what could I say, stormy, but also uh, entertaining. <laughs> I think funny. I think the world gets, I think there's a certain amount of schadenfreude on the part of the listener, listening to, you know, how we describe each other and the relationship and, uh, you know, there's singing and there's laughing and there's cursing and there's crying. And uh, I think my life continues to be this way. It hasn't changed. Yeah. I was mentioning to you um, a little earlier about my daughter living in um, Brooklyn, the area of New York, Brooklyn. And you said, where where was she living? And I said, Park Slope. And you said, oh, the posh part. And I've been thinking, what was it like? for you in Brooklyn when you grew up? Is it the Brooklyn of today? So Brooklyn's huge. It has two and a half million people. So it's the largest and most populous borough. It's not physically the largest, but it's by far the most populous borough. And so your experience of New York City and your experience of Brooklyn, some of it is a shared experience, but a, a, like how you grew up is largely determined by the area you grew up in. And if people who are from any large city understand that the neighborhood is more determinative. So that's the way it was for me. So I grew up in a neighborhood called Sheepshead Bay. It was very white working class. Uh, everybody who was there at that time, it's now completely changed. The ethnic makeup is completely changed. It's the second place you end up. The first place is the people who are literally right off the boat because it's, it's all people who are the children of immigrants, as is ever the American story. And uh, the first place you end up is in a ghetto. And the second place you end up is in a place like Sheepshead Bay, which is slightly better than the ghetto, but not really great yet. Still pretty conservative. There's a whole sort of a, a, the smell of the old world is still on it in many ways. It's also really ugly. Everything was built in the post-war period, but it had the advantage of, it had a couple of advantages. The subway, which could take you anywhere out of Sheepshead Bay. And believe me, it was like coming from a small town, a place you wanted to leave. Uh, but it was also really close to the sea. It was close to Coney Island, which you may have heard of, and Brighton Beach. And so its proximity to places much more interesting was, was okay. But Sheepshead Bay itself, you know, it was a, a, I would say it was largely made up of uh, Ashkenazi Jews, so Jews from Northern Europe, and uh, Italians, which, and some Irish, which through some strange quirk, some strange ethnic alchemy, turns out to be an ethnic mix which really works. So there was... If there was ever conflict in that area, it was never ethnic. Nobody was calling each other ethnic names. You know what I mean? It was just take, like for everybody, it was like taken for granted that you were either Jewish or you were Italian or you were Irish. And it was all good. It was all good for some reason. Yeah, I ne we, there were always fights. There was always problems because it was a working class neighborhood. But it was never about your ethnicity. Isn't that interesting? I was about to say... London, we have the same sort of thing, yeah. but yeah, I don't know. When I when I was young, yeah, I I can't remember the ethnic name calling, but I do remember that we would call each other's names whether we, whether we came from North, South, East, or West London. So right, yeah. we were ethnically like joined up in each of those those areas. You mentioned about working for Radio Netherlands mm -hmm. um, when you started your journalistic career. Is Radio Netherlands what? led you to leave Brooklyn and come to Europe? It is not. I, I think I said just a little bit earlier that I had a Dutch girlfriend and that was the reason. We met in New York and I came to the Netherlands to be with her, but we broke up fairly quickly and then I stayed in the Netherlands for a few years and then I met my wife Dragana, who is from like here, right? So, uh, uh, but Radio Netherlands uh, was a wonderful place. It was a wonderful place to work, especially back in the 90s and in the the naughties, you know, uh, even as it was becoming more and more irrelevant, the, in, the internet had made it more and more irrelevant. I can't believe it lasted till 2012. That's when they shut it down. A shortwave broadcaster, 64 million euros a year, somehow. It made it all the way to 2012. 
but uh, uh, especially in the English department where I worked, it was an incredible place to start off a journey as a a journalist, a podcast, or a radio maker, as a documentarian, because the people who worked there were immensely erudite. The backgrounds of the people were were incredibly varied. They came from all over the English-speaking world, plus some uh, Dutch people. The uh, and you had a lot of freedom to learn how to become good at the job, right? You could start at the bottom and there were always people to teach you and you can get really, really good. And especially towards the end there at the English department, we were making amazing programs. We realized that shortwave was dead. So we, in the English department, stopped focusing on that. We started making programs purely for transcription, which means we'd make a show and we'd distribute it for, uh, for other people to broadcast. And so at one point we were making a show called The State We're In, which I was the host of. Let's let the truck pass. Yes. <laughs> uh, we were making a show called The State We're In, uh, which was uh, broadcast in uh, 60 NPR affiliates across the United States in very, very large uh, metropolitan areas nationwide on Canada and Radio 1 and also on Australia nationwide, in Australia nationwide. So uh, we were immensely successful. The problem was, of course, is that the rest of the broadcaster, which was many different language sections, did not modernize in the same way. So, you know, the hammer came down eventually as we kind of knew it would at some point. Podcasting, you, you've mentioned there, is people now talk about podcasting, I think, more than they talk about what we would know as traditional radio. It's, and everybody seems to be wanting to become a podcaster. Yeah. They, 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 get a, they even use the microphone on their laptop um, uh, and they start to create content. As somebody that's into podcasting, very, very good at it, trains people in doing it. What is your real honest uh, opinion of the state of podcasting at the moment? I mean, back in 2007, I think that podcasting actually started somewhere around there, if I'm not mistaken. But now everybody's doing it. How do you view the the podcasting ecosystem? I mean, it's it's the, the question is you've uh, framed it can only be answered in the broadest of strokes because it's so big now, right? So the 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 simplest answer I can give is is that uh, podcasting has become as big as it has become simply because the it's so easy to start and so cheap, which is fantastic. But what that means is is that there's a literally thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of podcasts out there, most of which are amateurish and, and not so interesting. And and amongst them, there might be a gem, but that's really far more the exception than the rule. And it continues to be, and this is almost the same as blogging. Remember how blogging was really big, but most of it was terrible. And in the end, blogging's kind of dead now, and most people went back to the professionals right? The newspapers, right? The professional news broadcasters, because they, they're professionals, they know what they're doing, they curate the information. And to a certain extent, they're more trustworthy. Um, So that's, that's kind of the way it is with with podcasting right now is, yes, you can find almost anything that you want out there. But in the end, I think if you want quality, you're going to find yourself going back to the people who are curating the information and the people who know what they're doing and the people who know how to write and the people who are tastemakers. And the word that we use these days are influencers, right? Those people who are quite good at it. I think the cream always does rise to the top, right? And that's the way it is with podcasting. So I say as a professional podcaster, I don't feel threatened in any way by people wanting to go out there and making kinds of podcasts out there. We would appeal to a very different audience. And also, why not start a podcast, right? You got to start somewhere. It's just a hell of a lot easier. Get your, you know, start, start what you're, what you're, uh, start a show if you want to. Talk about what you want to talk about. And you might find that you're good at it and that you become more interested in getting better and you get the practice in and why not? It's all fine. It's all good. If you go to your website, and I'll put the link in the description uh, below, it's Grew Bear Media. One of the things that I, I picked up, first of all, was that you produce for the Dutch national flag carrier airline, uh, KLM, um, uh, a podcast series. And I was going through that and I thought, wow, um, the 
I think the, the in phrase is the production values are really, really high yeah. uh, yes. uh, on this. Your client base now and people that you train now, are they more corporate orientated or are they uh, for, like you say, the influencer, the more personal podcast? Yeah, no. So uh, the trainers, I train journalists. And I'll train them how to make podcasts as well. But for the most part, I train journalists. I train them in uh, investigative journalism. I train them in narrative journalism and in podcasting. How to, how to tell a story, that kind of a thing. The podcasting business that I have on the side is I either can produce podcasts or, and this happens more often than not, is I get hired as a host to present and to ask questions and to write scripts and that kind of thing. And sometimes they'll get hired by other podcasting production companies. So, for example, the KLM podcast you talked about, The Journey, that uh, was actually another company. Uh, I, I'm going to give them their new name. Shouts out to you, Marvin Airborne. The Airborne is a great branded podcasting production company in the Netherlands. They are extremely good. And they've carved a place for themselves out in the market of only doing high quality, right? Because I make a lot of other podcasts for other broadcasters in the Netherlands as well. But a lot of that stuff is cheap and cheerful, right? Very easy, just roundtable interview kind of stuff that's super fast to make and takes a minimum of pre-production. And, uh, and I'm perfectly happy to do that. And sometimes it's even really good. Uh, but the stuff that we did for KLM, that was fantastic. They, they, and, and Airborne only makes high quality stuff, right? That's their section of the market. And so the, the idea was for KLM was to produce something that had something to do with travel. That's why it's called the journey. But really most of the traveling, even though there was obviously physical traveling involved, happens inside people's minds and the experiences that they had. And then there's, uh, there was an excellent budget for doing all of the sound design to make it all sound fantastic. Right. And we had the time and this is a real luxury in today's world, the time to find guests who had really good stories. That's probably at least 50 percent of the work is finding the right person to talk to. Right. You mentioned storytelling um, and I'm passionate about trying to find stories, whether I'm a good storyteller or not. That's that's uh, a different um, issue. But to go back to your visit here and what you see has changed from, as you say, back in 1997 to here we are in 2021. I would say this region has got amazing stories to tell. Sure but when you go onto your favorite um, search engine of choice, um, you don't find much in the way of positive stories or storytelling. You just find a whole host of misery uh, and anguish. Why do you think that is? There's a lot of reasons. I mean, the first is, is that it, if we're talking specifically about the news business, bad news is news. If it bleeds, it leads, right? Good news stories don't really get done. That's just not how the news industry works. And uh, the, the, the second thing here, of course, is that, you know, up until the advent of the Internet, this was a deeply isolated part of the world. You know, and you could tell that, you know, you cross the, the border over a Gradishka and you ended up in, a, in another world that was like 20 years behind, you know, and it had a particular look. It had a particular feel, uh, technologically undeveloped. And, you know, uh, and of course, at, especially back then, this is all changing in the younger generation, uh, people who were wonderfully uh, monolingual, you know, <laughs> if you didn't speak Serb or Croat, you had a problem. Because nobody here is going to speak your language, right? And, you know, it's not exactly the most cosmopolitan place, you know? These things are all changing. I, I mean, this place is becoming ever more open. And people here are beginning to, especially the younger generation, they're all learning English. The Internet, again, is, is changing all of that. Um, but there just wasn't a lot going on. And then also, let's not forget that this is the the Serb part of Bosnia and the Serbs were largely painted and probably there's a good argument to be made for that as the bad guys in the war. So the Serbs get a lot of bad press despite the fact that on a 
one-to-one basis, you'd be hard-pressed in Europe to find more congenial, open, friendly, generous people than the Serbs. I say I have so much love in my heart for the Serbs and for the people who live here. And uh, uh, this is a fantastic place filled with marvelous people. But there's no getting around the fact that in this last war, not talking about the cycles of wars previous, but in this last war, the Serbs were the aggressors. And as a result of that, they get painted with that particular brush. Now, in the wars prior to that, they were often the victims, which explains why they developed this sort of never-again mentality and became the aggressors in this last war. But this is how the, And this is how the cycle of violence works. But there's no getting around the fact that as a result of this last war, the, the uh, perception is that the Serbs are uh, uh, crazy and violent. They're not. They're not crazy and violent. They're kind of fantastic. But there is this perception and there's no getting around it. When I've had guests visiting here uh, and they walk through the the main street of Banja Luka or they they travel around into uh, the villages, yeah, they they actually say that this is a a pretty cool place to be. And sometimes, you know, when you're making stories, when you're, you know, coming up with things, me in particular, just small village stories or small town stories, the reaction from people is quite overwhelmingly one of surprise. People still make mention of the war when I tell people I'm going away. Is it safe? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, this war ended in 96. (laughs) It's 2021. Yeah, it's safe. Nobody's got a gun. I'd rather walk through the center of Banja Luka at four in the morning than walk through the center of St. Louis. You know, that's walking through St. Louis or, certain, you know, certain parts, a lot of parts of the United States these days at night is a far more dangerous prospect than walking anywhere here. This is a really safe part of the world. You've been here for a few weeks now. Um, what have your highlights been from this trip? And I, I say that because, you know, on, on a first trip, everything is those first impressions and people refer, oh, the highlights are, but... Y- you're a return visitor. Yeah. Um, what have the highlights been about this visit? So probably the, the, the uh, well, we built a pool at our weekend itza thing. My wife surprised me. Oh, tell me about your weekend itza. That's amazing. So my wife is from a, a, a very, a village very close by. She's actually grew up in, the, in Banja Luka, but her family is from a village like, what, five, ten minutes from here uh, called Shishnyari. And uh, they've always had land there and in fact if we keep going back to the war that land saved them because they were able to grow a lot of food yeah like here where we're sat now yeah yeah and uh uh but my wife like about maybe starting about 10 years ago she got this vision of building a little a, a, a beautiful house she's got a great eye and she's a really good designer and then i can't even remember exactly when but about seven or eight years ago maybe even five years ago i can't remember the house turned up it just turned up one day she she did it. She went on a visit and she had it designed and she had people build it. And it was it was there. And it's kind of amazing. It's not big. It's we this term weekendica that you can hear the word weekend in there. Right. So your little weekend house like the Russians call it. We call it a dacha or something mm-hmm. like that. Right. Yeah. And uh, it's always meant to be small and simple. This was nice. This is not so simple. This house It's really nice, small, but very modern. And uh, uh, this last time around, she surprised me. She managed to keep it from me, but she'd had an in-ground pool built as well. So this thing has just been fantastic. So definitely the highlight for me and for my kids and for all of us and has and the center of the extended family here has been the arrival of the pool because we're all having a great time with that. The second thing that happened here, because when we always go, when we come, we always spend at least five or six days on the Croatian coast, which, Frogs, if you've never been there, it's quite beautiful. Uh, uh, we, we discovered Opatia. I've never been to Opatia before, which is never been there. We, we, we normally go to Rab if we go to the Croatian coast of the islands, right? Yeah, Yeah. 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 So Opatia is right next to Rijeka, which is one of the larger cities on, if you go to the very top of the Adriatic sea or something like that, right? No, to, no, if you go to the very top of where the Istrian Peninsula begins, which is this peninsula just at the top of the Adriatic Sea, 
you sort of round the corner, right at the top of that corner, you have the larger city of Rijeka, which is a mini, medium-sized city. And then below that, you have Opatia. And Opatia was built by the Habsburgs. And it couldn't be prettier. Every building is just one sort of garishly pink or pastelly purple cake box building after another. It's apparently that's where the the Habsburg royal family would also summer. So the whole thing is just stunning. And we stayed at a really nice hotel called the Gardenia and we just had this sort of like old worldy European experience. And uh I mean Croatia's way too expensive, but Nothing like Bosnia. Bosnia is just so cheap. But Croatia is very expensive these days. But it was totally worth it. My God, that place was beautiful. So we like really like relaxed and ate delicious food. Also, and this is, this is just me. And I think you and I differ on this a little bit. I think the food here can be a bit basic. It's good, but it's a bit basic. But over on the, in the Istrian Peninsula, they used to be Italy. Right? They were part of Italy. The food over there is something else. I mean, it's... It, well, yeah. A couple I'm, of levels higher, you know? Yeah, I but mean, if you go south, if you go south of the Croatian coast down to Dalmatia, then you get... That, that, is, that is different as well, right? Well, the Dalmatians... I mean, you could say technically they were part of Italy because the Venetian Empire, right, built all this stuff up and down the coast. And it looks like it, too, in the architecture, but they haven't been there for a while. <laughs> and, and, you can, and you can tell in the food because it's, things start to get a little basic again. You know what I mean? Good fish. Very good fish. But over in, in, in Istria, you can see that the, that the Italians were there until quite recently. <laughs> so what is your, it's fantastic. You know? So what is your favorite meal? If you, it, it, regardless of whether it's in Croatia or Slovenia or, or wherever, it doesn't matter. In this region, what would you say would be the go-to meal for you? Please don't say chivap. No, I hate chivap, Gigi. Um, which is going to upset a lot of people listening to this because that is the national dish of Yugoslavia, is Chivapcici. To me, it's taking halfway decent meat and turning it into some kind of spongy crap that I don't like. It's like so spongy, spongy. It's terrible. But the uh, uh, what they do do really well around here is anything that involves uh, a lamb that's been, because they'll make like lambs on a spit, that kind of thing. And if they serve it hot, because if you get very unlucky here people will get all fancy and serve it to you cold so that the fat congeals and that becomes inedible they think it's delicious around here but it's not but if you get it hot it's fantastic and there's another thing that they do around here which is great which is something that's called ispod ispod sach ispod sacha yeah right which basically means under the sach which is this uh like metal contraption right in which you have food inside this big cast iron plate and then you put all the food in there, everything, the meat, the vegetables, the potatoes, you put it all into there. And then you lower on this chain, you lower another cast iron lid, which goes on top of it. And then they put coals, hot coals all around it. And you just leave it alone. That is anything that cooks in that thing is amazing. Like amazing. It's like the meat just falls apart on the bone and it gets this nice sort of slightly charcoaly edge to it. That's, that's just great. Really great. That's probably the most special way of cooking around here. It's unusual. It's delicious. It's very fresh. And and there's one other thing that's around here that is second to none, and that is the a tomato called the volovotserce, which means heart of the volovov, whatever that is. But that is hands down the best tomato I've ever had in my life. And it's weird to sort of wax poetic about a tomato. But these are the best tomatoes of anywhere on earth. <laughs> it's like a, like a steak, that tomato. It's so meaty. You know? It's spectacular. I don't know. How can you talk about a tomato like this? But it's, it's really amazing. You know you can go to the Banja Luka market on a Sunday morning. You can buy a satch. You could take it back to the Netherlands and maybe introduce Ispod Satcha to the, to the Dutch. How do you think they would take that? Or would you even consider doing it? Me, I might, I might consider doing it. Not bringing it back to the Netherlands because I don't have that kind of a, a situation. You need, let's just say you need a fireproof situation. <laughs> and I live in Amsterdam, so we don't have that kind of a situation, you know? It could be a new way of doing barbecue. It could be, you know, it's, sure, sure. And the Dutch have really gotten into, they've really taken to barbecues. So it, I think, and there's one, always some group of enthusiasts, you know what I mean, that would consider doing something like that. 
Uh, if I have my own house in a backyard, I might do that. But I don't. I have a house, but I live in the center of Amsterdam. It wouldn't work. I'd set the place on fire. <laughs> <laughs> you sent me a message saying, do you fancy coming to the American corner in Banja Luka? Uh, I couldn't come to see you, but you... And what is that? You, what is the American Corner? It's a, I believe it's an American community centre. I don't know, but it's an information uh, yeah, point. Yeah, right. um, and you were talking about um, narrative journalism. Yeah. Um, what was it like f for you to talk to uh, people from the city and people from the region about narrative journalism? For example, did they even know what narrative journalism was? I think they got the idea, but they'd never really experienced it. Um, and narrative journalism, for people who are wondering what that is, a standard form of journalism is the five W's and an H journalism, where you have the inverted pyramid and you get all the information in, in the first two paragraphs of a story or right at the beginning of a, of a uh, television news story or a radio news story, right? You get it all in. In a narrative news story, you don't do it that way. In a narrative news story, it's you, you're literally telling it in, in story form, right? So you create a central question and you this, basically the story gets more interesting as you go along rather than less interesting, like in a standard news story. And you build it all the way to a climax. And so the idea is that you want to uh, give people the news, but you want to do it in story form so that they become more emotionally involved because human beings have evolved to uh, uh, attach uh, emotion to information. And if you do that, you retain it much better. And, and this is very important, you care more about it. Um, whereas most of the time, if you have a news story, you don't really care all that much. Um, you get the information but you don't retain much and you sort of move on to the next thing. And whereas if you tell somebody something in story format, they, they understand why something matters to them. The, the stories become humanized. They can relate it to their own lives and, and then they care. So that's the main difference between uh, five W's and an H journalism and narrative journalism. And so I prefer to do narrative journalism. It's, it's more satisfying as a journalist as well to do it that way. What was the response to, to what you were talking about? Was it, oh, here he comes talking about something new or is it something that you think might be embraced? Because when you, especially with television here, when you watch uh, television from almost anywhere in the region, it's, it's definitely the W's and the H. I, well, first of all, people, professionals from that industry did not come to the American corner that day, probably because they don't speak English. That's probably the biggest issue. Uh, and also because it was very impromptu. We set it up. I did it on a Wednesday. We'd actually, I met the person at the American Corner, quite coincidentally, uh, at a barbecue where we were doing Ispot Sacha. And uh, it was the son of a friend, uh, your doctor. And uh, he... Oh, Berko. Yeah, Berko's son uh -huh. runs the American Corner. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he uh, 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 said, why don't you come and talk there? So it was literally Sunday we agreed to do it. Monday it was advertised, and then we did it on Wednesday. So there wasn't a lot of time for a huge crowd to come. So we had a good, I don't know, it seemed like 10 people were there in the end. And it was the, all the people who came saw the usefulness of this, seemed to have a really good time, and see it left, I think, kind of inspired by uh, the concepts that were in it. And also the way that I've teached it. I've been teaching it for a long time, so I've kind of gotten good at it now. And so they seemed kind of inspired by the whole thing. And that's great. But is it going to have a, is it going to have an effect on how journalism here works? No, not yet. Maybe. I think things are changing a lot. Like like I said, the internet is uh, has changed kind of everything. The whole paradigm of how everything works uh, and how people are influenced here it was all used to be very insular and a very closed world. But there's this whole new generation of people growing up in Bosnia regardless of their backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, they're all having a, the shared experience of being young and being exposed to how social media works now. And they're going to be so different from their parents. So how it will all work in the future, I don't know. But I know it won't be the same. I know it's going to be very, very different. Yeah. I'm wondering about, yeah, how people will tell stories about the country and the region as it is today. There's very few of us online telling stories, I think, in a meaningful way. 
Um, and I'm finding it very difficult to find a key that will unlock the potential of people from here to to start to talk about where they come from. You know, when as I go, go on to say about people that we, we host here, um, and they meet local people the, almost without fail, it's, why did you come here? And if that is the underlying, if, if that is the underlying, if that is the underlying thought going through people from here, to get good stories coming out of this country, being told by the people from this country, it looks like a bit of a Mount Iger situation, but with very little in the way of climbing gear. Yeah. I mean, there's this is a mixed blessing, though, isn't it? Because on the one hand, the fact that it's a bit of an undiscovered part of Europe means that it's not being overrun which every other part of nice part of Europe has been overrun. Uh, I think they'll get here eventually. I think the, probably there's a number of big issues. But issue number one is the fact that all of Bosnia is not in the EU. It's, there, it's not even in the running to, to get into the EU. There's no discussion about it. And there's poor road infrastructure. So getting to this part, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all a bit unknown. It's all a bit difficult. I mean, how long are the lines at the borders? Imagine you booked a vacation here. How long are you going to, and you want to come during the summer. How long are you going to be in line at the border just to get into the country? What a pain in the butt. The upside is now is that over in this little old airport we have here at Banja Luka, there are now a few uh, of the low-cost carriers that are regularly bringing people here. And that's a much easier way of getting in than, than by driving. But traditionally in Europe, people pack up the car with the kids, you know, and they come on over, even though this part of the world has lots of things to do. And there's a whitewater rafting and it's very beautiful. And, you know, the countryside is, you know, how many unspoiled countrysides do you have left in Europe? Well, Bosnia's got that, right? It's a, it's a rarity in this continent. Uh, but, you know, how do you sell it? How do you sell the former war zone with long lines at the borders and poor infrastructure and the 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 continuing instability it's a tough sell you got to get people to invest in it and they won't as long as this place as long as the way bosnia is run is all up in the air and you never know what's going to happen the next day or if it's all going to kick off again one day even though it doesn't really seem like that's the case to me i don't think anybody feels like picking up their guns anytime soon but it's unstable and weird and if you're a business, would you invest in this part of the world when you really don't know what's going to happen? I'd think about it, you know? I wouldn't be sure. And that's a tragedy, of course, because this place is kind of great. Yeah. Listen, we've been chatting for quite some time. What is next for Jonathan Gruber? I know you're going to say, I'm, my wife is going to come and pick me up and then I'm going to go back to the, <laughs> and I'm going to go back to the pool and everything else like that. But... What is what is what is next in your world? In my world, I'm uh, my vacation's coming to an end. I've got to go back to work soon, and I'll be teaching uh, for the Radio Netherlands Training Center, and uh, I'll be teaching. We should get you to come back and teach here. We should find somebody. Sure. We should find somebody that will fund a course with one of the leading podcasters. That'd be interesting, wouldn't it? It would be interesting, and in fact, the the organization that I teach for. Most of the students who uh, are in the course, like like 95% of them, get a grant from the Dutch government to be in the course because they're from people who are mid-career journalists from developing countries. Bosnia and Herzegovina is not on that list. They don't do Europe, I think. As far as I can tell, there are no grants available. And really, they should be, don't you think? Well, this, I do. This I, country I do. really should be, a, they should be a grant. This is a developing country. It's a second world country. And it could use that kind of professional media training. Why not? So that's what I'm going to be doing. And then I'm going to be make, working on more podcasts. Uh, and uh, I have a few things lined up. And then I'll be teaching uh, radio journalism at the University of Groningen in the north of the Netherlands at the end of the year. And that's what's happening in Gruber world. In Gruber world, when he's teaching at the University of Groningen... Does he speak Dutch or does he speak English? It's uh, it's the I can actually speak Dutch, but it's the international. Uh, it's the they have an, like an international masters, so I do it in English because everybody there is from most of the people in my classes, not all, but most are not from the Netherlands. So, and if people want to get hold of you, how can they do it? 
So you can go to grubearmedia.com, G-R-E-W, mm, how do I say it? G-R-E, <laughs> it's G-R-E-W-B-E-A-R, like Gru Bear. I, I love it. I don't even know. I um, honestly, I don't pay a lot of attention to my own website. I really. And you're need, in the media. I need to update it. <laughs> I really need to update my website. It's true. Uh, uh, so g r e w b e a r media dot com. So that's not how I spell my last name, but that's how it sounds because it's Gru Bear rhymes with Pooh Bear. <laughs> Jonathan, thank you so much for your time it's a today. Pleasure, pleasure. <laughs>